Welcome to Hidden Conversations. Hidden Conversations is coordinated by WVIK and hosted by Dr. Ladrina Wilson, a leadership and diversity expert and founder of Iman Consulting. These conversations are designed to delve into many of the most difficult issues of race and equity facing the Quad Cities today. Many of these issues we hear about every day on the national news, but then are left unaware when they occur to our own friends and neighbors. We hope that by hearing firsthand stories and statistics from experts based right here in the Quad Cities, we can break down the myth that these things only happen somewhere else, and in so doing, increase our empathy for those who literally live right next door. Thank you for joining us this evening. Here's Dr. Ladrina Wilson. Good evening. Our schedule has been a little different in the last few weeks um, and over the summer months. So I feel like I was just with you all. And in fact, I was. It's been about, I don't know, two weeks maybe since our last conversation. And boy, was it a good one. And I anticipate today's conversation, uh, this evening's conversation will be equally um, as enlightening. So I am excited for the opportunity to um, talk a little bit today about literacy, authorship and uh, the publication process. And why we chose to do this is we're exploring different dynamics um, of the black experience in the Quad Cities. Um, Of course, thematic across our um, conversations has been this notion of representation, uh, but how we got to the point where we wanted to look at authorship um, and that process that writers go through is really connected to this conversation around literacy, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? Um, So we know that right now, according to Data USA, which is a public um, organization that looks uh, a conglomerate of organizations that work together to look at U.S. uh, government data. And according to uh, Data USA, about 81 percent of uh, writers and authors uh, are from the white community um, and and white culture. And um, about six percent are are black or African-American and being the second largest group. So. What, would, what I'm trying to better understand, and I'll talk today with some of our guests about is, you know, we've, we've heard from our pre, prior conversations that um, literacy continues to be an issue um, in terms of education and where maybe our Black students are lagging behind um, other demographics. And so we also know that representation um, continues to be uh, um, an issue. And so is that, is that what's a barrier to creating access to certain careers or certain opportun- opportunities? And I'm wondering if it's not a both and type of approach. So I can distinctly um, remember having opportunities for creative writing, you know, as a youth. And as I watch and now on the parental side of education, right, and watching my daughters uh, go through their education, it things look a lot different, right? The There's this common core that they're following that limits their ability to do some of the creative things that we did when I was in school. So that that requires then, from my perspective, us as parents or caregivers to be in a position where we're exposing our children to um, opportunities through reading to them and you know doing our own research. I mean, I create homework for my kids to do during the summer and in the evenings. And we know that some homes, especially those homes that um, are low income homes, maybe don't always have access to even books. And if you come from an experience where you either have experienced um, where you felt isolated in the education system, you may not have a love for reading, but yet you're needing to read to your kids in order to boost their access to literacy and hopefully instill in them a a spirit of wanting to, to read and to write. We know these are critical skills that are needed in our world of work. We know that um, there's a lot that people can learn outside of a classroom if you have those basic literacy skills. And so today um, we are going to bring in our special guests who are published um, authors and um, they're going to share with us kind of what what some of their inspirations were. Um, They're going to share with us a little bit about uh, their material and why they think it's important and relevant to uh, to share their intellectual property with the world. Um, and they're also going to talk to us a little bit about this kind of chicken and the egg thing. Which one comes first? Does literacy impact your your access to being an author or does lack of rep- representation access, uh, excuse me, impact your access to wanting to aspire to be an author? And perhaps it's, it's both and. 
So with that, we have got three phenomenal individuals with us today. I think we do have a little feedback, so we'll be riding the mute to make sure everybody can hear us okay. Um, but I will um, go ahead and allow you to do a brief introductions. Well, maybe you know what I'll do is I'll just briefly introduce you um, and then I'll turn it over to you to give us a little bit more about your background. Mm -hmm. I'll start with you, Key, and uh, we've got Key Lawson here. And I, I can't wait to be able to talk for you to talk a little bit about your genre, your writing style and, and kind of what you bring uh, to this space. We've got uh, Reverend Dwight Ford, um, who is a, a known activist in our community, um, an, in, an intellect and, and has a great, um, oh gosh, historical knowledge that he shares with people on a very regular basis and, and through his writings as well. And then we have the illustrious Shelley Moore guy, who is um, just a staple in our community, also um, a very well-known activist and, and really honestly an inspiration to me in so many ways. And I know how many lives she's touched and, and she's also a very established um, and prolific writer um, and has some designations to, to go alongside that, not just my opinion. So with that, what I'll do is I'll start with you, Key. If you would just tell us a little bit about your background and how you decided to become an author um, and maybe what some of your influences were. Okay. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, great. Okay, so hi. Um, hello, everyone. Hello to the panel. Again. Um, <clears throat> my name is Key. I am a um, author um, and a counselor here in the, in the Quad City area. Um, I basically write about love stories. And what um, got me to wanting to write about this is because I come from a family of nine aunties and um, I grew up around wonderful women. And that that's pretty much what I've seen. I've seen all dynamics of it, but at the end of the day, it always mattered to love. And then I was introduced at a young age um, to an author by the name of Sister Soldier, um, Sister Soja. And um, she wrote the book, The Coldest One Ever. And it just changed my life. I don't know what it did. It just, it just really just spoke to me. And I, ever since then, I've just been writing, <laughs> writing. And um, <clears throat> I wasn't confident enough to put out my work until I was 28 years old, but I've been writing since I was about 12 years old. And I still have those old journals. They're all beat up, but those are my babies. Those are priceless. <laughs> I love it. I, I think there's so much power in, in being able to hold on to those things and going back and reflecting uh, on a personal level, but then also looking at your growth, right? Like how you yes. have come into your own and in that space. Now, you said you're a counselor as well. Do you work with certain uh, age groups or do you counsel all different ages? Um, I work. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, doctor. Um, I work with um, adults um, with disabilities right now, and um, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I've been in this field for uh, for 10 years. I've been studying and working in this field for 10 years. So it's a passion of mine. I just love being around um, individuals that, because um, I, I come from, um, as they call it, underserved populations, basically, you know, um, lower socioeconomic status populations, or, or AKA what we call it, the hood. So I lived in Chicago prior to living here. <clears throat> so um, I know how it feels to, um, to, to go without. I know how it feels to um, live next to people that are struggling. We had our own struggles as a family as well. Um, and so I've always just been drawn to helping people overcome because um, with the help of my mother, and both my dads, I was able to overcome. Awesome, awesome. So um, I was curious as, as, as to whether or not you're able to use that skill, you know, that you have it or uh, inspire other people that you work with through writing. And so I know that sometimes I see, you know, my daughters will want to access even just writing in a journal as an exercise can help you build that skill. And so I was just curious about that. And please call me Ladrina. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, you don't have I'm to sorry. be <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yes, um, it definitely has. I have things um, I have. Well, being, you know, with people with disabilities, they all think that they're not um, that they really, you know, there's negative stereotypes about them. And so um, what I've come to learn within the 10 years I've been working is that you have 
um, individuals with disabilities who are amazing writers, amazing storytellers. Um, I have people that are aspiring journalists on my caseload right now. And so, of course, you know, anywhere that I can help because I also own a writing company, um, KL Publishing LLC, just a plug. <laughs> and um, I help individuals with all, all kind of writing um, to my best ability. And so um, if it's anything where it's okay, you go over a cover letter to, um, you know, read this poem for me. How do you think I'm doing on my journal, you know, on this journal here? Um, of course, I, I assist and it and it inspires me as well because if they can do it, you know, with so many stigmas and so many things thrown at them, you know, I have no excuse. And like my mother said, if English is your first language, um, you should always be reading or writing something. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you said it was a little shameless plug. Let's go ahead and put it out there. You said KAL Publishing. Yes, um, KAL Publishing LLC. It's my writing company. I help individuals um, to business plans, grants, uh, resumes, cover letters, um, and pretty much a lot of the stuff, just anything writing. As long as I know how to read it, if it's not, um, you know, those uh, long legal jargon <laughs> and everything, um, I pretty much know how to do. So yes, I do. And uh, shout out to everybody that's been visiting my website and been reaching out to me, all my clients. I love you guys so much. Well, and I think it's important that you share what you do, right? Because it's a resource. And um, yes, as we can, yeah, as we continue to have these conversations, hopefully someone is inspired. You know, you said you didn't get going. You said it took you until you were 28, which I think is far earlier than most people feel confident in their own skin, right? So if it took you that long, perhaps by being a resource to other people, um, even sooner or even later in life, you know, they'll know what's available to them. So I don't think you have to have any shame um, in putting it out there because we do want people to get something from this, um, e even if it's a resource or inspiration. Moving right along, I'm going to, I see the Reverend Ford next on my screen. So um, can you give us a little bit of background about you as it relates to your writing, your journey to become an author and, and just kind of what some of your influences were? Sure. First of all, thank you for uh, allowing this wonderful conversation. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ladrina Wilson. I know I'm going to call you Ladrina after this, but honorifics are important. It is an earned degree, um, professional and well uh, deserved at that. Um, the, the journey for me perhaps started as a child. My father and grandfather, um, I always saw magazines. I didn't see as many books but our house was literally littered with magazines. Uh, they read every day. And so as a child, I was always exposed to particularly seeing my grandfather as a very young child. Of course, we had Ebony's and Jets uh, that were previewed, but they were sportsmen. So they always had hunting and fishing magazines. And so those were my earliest um, kind of experiences with reading that helped shape my understanding of how to tell a story. Um, I naturally gravitated relationally from, relational skills from my mother and kind of the speaking skills uh, from my father, talking to everyone from people that are walking down the street to be able to talk with dignitaries. I learned that in my household. So I grew up in a family of storytellers, started drinking coffee very young, um, and, and because that's what the older folk did, they, they drank coffee and told stories. So when I could finally be associated, particularly with the men in my family, I was really socialized by the men in my family. Uh, there hasn't been a time where I wasn't surrounded by men, men that were readers, men that were speakers, men that were protectors. And so out of that became the stories. And so I gravitated to the stories. So I learned how to speak long before I ever learned how to write. And so my journey started actually with a skill set in speaking that transferred over to writing. So after the military, uh, I started uh, at Black Hawk and wrote a few things, and then I went to Jackson State. While at Jackson State, it was that experience with professors that recognized me. My family went to Jackson State or they came from the same community. And one of my English uh, professors, again, has asked me to stay after for a class and he put a paper in my hand. He said, I want you to apply for this writing contest. And it was all the local uh, colleges in the Jackson Metro area that was competing in a writing contest. 
And I said, I'll do my best. And it was something about globalization or something of that matter. I submitted my paper and a few weeks later, he asked me to stay after again. Um, and he asked me, he said, uh, well, I want to talk to you about your paper. And I immediately started apologizing. I said, listen, I did my best, Professor McGinn. I didn't, I, I wanted to try to represent you well. You nominated me. He said, Ford, what are you talking about, Dwight? You, you won. And, and that really, really helped me to understand that I could write uh, and convey uh, an understanding. And it was through that time that I really started really working uh, on how to tell a story better and convey it. So I remember going to the writing labs and I recommend that anybody that's interested, take, go to the writing labs if you're a college student, use those. And I was not getting the marks that I thought I deserved on my papers. And the professors would ask me, well, what are you trying to say? And I would say it. And they said, write it just like you said it. And that's, that's when it started clicking for me. I started writing. Uh, and one of the highest compliments that I received, I was doing um, um, graduate work at Harvard. And one of my advisors, they were reviewing my, my final submission. He says, I could hear you say these things when I was reading your work. And he said, you write in the tone. Now, I don't compare myself this way. He said, you write in the tone uh, like a Cornell West. And to me, that was one of the highest compliments in writing because that was one of my inspirations. So I drew inspiration. Um, the first book in college I read after the military was uh, uh, Dick Gregory's uh, uh, book entitled The N-Word. All right? And I read it from cover to cover. I, it didn't stop because he told a wonderful story and because it had historical context. Then I picked up Cointelpro, those two books I bought at the same time and I read them immediately. Then after that, it was on. I read everything I could about the historical understanding of the black experience in America and began to figure out how to tell those stories through my own experience. And so the, the novel works of Zora Hill Nurston's, uh, Hurston's uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God, Alex Haley's um, The Autobiography of Malcolm X inspired me. Uh, Lorraine Hansberry, and anybody that's been around me any amount of time knows I quote from A Raisin in the Sun all the time, all the, absolutely all the time. My congregation hears that book more often than anything else outside the Bible. Uh, Frederick Douglass narrative, um, Alex, uh, I'm saying Alex, um, James Baldwin's work, um, The Fire Next Time, was an absolute game changer for me. So it was those type of riveting stories that could tell the Black experience uh, and put it in a historical time frame, so that you could see the journey and the work and the legacy and the tears. And that's what I've tried to mimic. That's what I continue to do um, in the work that is before me is that I wanna keep in that vein. Uh, um, I try to read as widely, so I'm inspired. I've always liked poetry and prose. I, I'm inspired by poets of our time. I listen, um, a lot of my sermons are littered also with songs, R&B uh, and hip hop because of the writing that goes into it. So I came to the genre of historical narrative, I probably would classify it uh, with a sense of uh, uh, probably approach like an ethicist would, trying to promote what we should do in this time uh, in that work as well. I came to it uh, perhaps from the vocation of preaching and I learned at Harvard, they told us either you publish or perish. And that put a fire under me to, to get something published. And I never forgot that. And because our history is so spoken um, and that which was written was taken and stolen and misappropriated, there's so much about uh, the long rich legacy of the black experience in the world, not just in America, that is unknown. So whenever I get a chance to share some of that story, I, I look forward to it. And you do a fantastic job with it. Um, I, you know, I, I'm hearing kind of across both of you, the, the you two individuals that have shared with us is your influence are shaped by in part your home life. Right. And those experiences that you had with the people who were closest to you. Um, and not necessarily in the context of always being an intentionally enriching opportunity, but just the fact that there were reading materials around or you're observing people 
and you're telling their stories in a different format or a different way through the love stories that you're referring to, Key, or through um, the relevance of having Black history documented and, and, and shared, right? So, you know, as I think about what you're saying, I'm trying to think through, like, how do I inspire the next generation who is connected to a cell phone and doesn't even out write out what are you doing? It's W-Y-D, right? Like there's this disconnect that has happened. And so I just want to play around with that. You know, as you're thinking through it, I want to make sure we give um, Miss Shelley her, her platform to tell us a little bit about her background and, and perhaps there's some overlap there too for uh, what your influences are, Shelley. Dr. Gonna... Dr. Ladrina, I have to say it too. <laughs> Proud of you. Proud of you. Thank you. Um, Key, uh, great to hear that you are writing that genre. I'm very proud of you. And you said you waited until you were 28. And I'm, I'm just saying, wow. Um, you are very young and very courageous. And, and Reverend Ford, you, you inspired me. I wrote down some things as you were uh, speaking. And I really love that publish or perish. And I think that's where I am right now in my life. But in order to talk about uh, my early influences, I, I would have to start with my parents as well. Um, I think there's a common thread uh, with a lot of us. Um, Reverend Ford mentioned that there were, uh, there were reading materials. So we had books and magazines or books and um, they or there was a set of encyclopedias and and we lived in the projects and so um, my both my parents were readers and lovers of of books they read to us and I, I I'll not forget you know those 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 uh, the influence of being read to uh, but not just being read to. Um, my father had a way of performing these little books that he would read to us. And um, I have a poem. Could I share this little short poem? And it's about my father and it's about reading, Excellent. if you don't mind. It's Excellent. called Remembering Melodies. And I, I wrote this, uh, I published this book of poetry in the mid nineties and it's called Remembering Melodies. And, and it's uh, taken after this particular poem. And it's a thank you note for those people. The melodies, the people are the melodies. Um, th that's all. I learned about the music in books at my daddy's knee. After dinner between jobs, watching him read the paper was an exciting ritual. To him, even the comics were important. He'd say, I don't care if you only read the comment, the comics, just read. After absorbing the notes, he'd fold each section neatly, taking his time, savoring the music. Sometimes before bedtime, the children gathered and he'd perform reading with special effects, pr pronouncing the S's, putting the question to the mark, the exclamation to the point. Examining report cards, he'd say, if a man can't read, he'll be walked on. When my children were small, I sang to them out of pages also. I hope they remember the melodies. So that's basically how I grew up. They, listen, when, they, when my father talked about reading and about the fact that you're gonna be walked on, he meant that. And so there were these books in the house that we had library cards, important, little things that are huge things like library cards. And they took us to the library and we would go on Saturday mornings. Um, that was how we were introduced and we would pick out our own books. But then the libraries had these little programs that they did on Saturday uh, Saturday mornings and we would go. So when, when we were old enough and back then they let us walk everywhere, you know? So we walked from the projects and our projects was Lincoln homes uh, by the King center. And we walked from there or we learned how to take the bus. And I remember there's a memory that is very vivid with me. And it, I, I will never forget the excitement that I had walking up 
the Rock Island Public Library steps to go into the library where the books were, where the stories were. And, you know, it's basically, it really had to do with that early example. Um, when my children were small, I did the same thing. Um, when you talk about um, parents who may not have a lot of money, and I and I and I have to go back to this. I never forget, and I always talk about how when I had my children, I was very very young. I mean, very young, a teenage parent, and I had had five children before I was 21 years old. The, my daughters, who are twins, were born um, in May. I was 20, uh, and I turned 21 that September, and they were youngest. Um, when you're that young, you have, you do not have the life experiences as a, you know, you don't have the same life experiences as an older parent would have. And so you can only draw upon what your early, what your early, how you were parented. You, you're going to draw on whatever you, however you were parented, whether that was positive or negative, because you don't have enough, you don't have another, you don't have another place to go to understand how to be a parent. You're too young. You could read about it. But normally we'll, we'll uh, especially that young, you'll just draw on your experiences. And, and my experiences in terms of education and reading, I had to fall back on my memories of how I was parented. And so therefore I knew if I didn't know anything else about parenting, I knew that there needed to be books in the home. I knew that I needed to read to my children. I knew that I needed to take them to libraries. Um, I, I knew if there was nothing else, if I didn't know anything else, I doubled down on what I knew. And that was what I knew. Um, and so when we talk about those early experiences, it's so important. Uh, and I say that from experience because I was a recipient of it. And I tried to instill that as well uh, with my children. Um, my earliest, uh, the first poet that I knew uh, was my brother, who was six years older than myself, who is six years older than me. And now when you're um, 12 and your brother is six years older and he's writing poetry, I mean, you know, you that, that's, a, that's a long reach. I, I just thought that he was, he was brilliant. You know, we just thought he was brilliant, you know, and I was 15 and he was six years older and you know, he's in college and he was um, and, and he was writing poetry and he would when we were younger, he was writing uh, my parents. We, we would have to sit down and listen to him recite this poetry. We had I had no idea what he was talking about, uh, but he was my first my, the first poet that I knew. Um, and, and in school, um, you know, when we were coming up. Um, here in, and I can only speak to what happened here in the Quad Cities. I know that it was different in other places probably, but we were not introduced to any, any uh, black uh, poets or, you know, not very many writers. I don't remember that at all. I remember being introduced to uh, the poets, um, you know, the white poets, and they were writing things that I could not identify with. And so, there were there was a time uh, when I was younger until I was like mid twenties where I believed that I could be a writer that I should write poetry, but I didn't have the courage to do that because I can tell you for certain I did not have the uh, there was those 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 poets that I needed to be reading were not were not had not been introduced to me and we there was hardly any representation until I. Um, took a class at Blackhawk College. And I, I had, I was forced to take a speech class. Now, you know, anybody that knows me knows that, you know, you, you, you can see I can talk, I can go, right? But I'm during that time, 
I, listen, they had to force me to take this. I had nowhere else, nowhere to hide. And I had to take the speech <laughs> class. And my brother was living with me at the time, the brother, the poet. And I had my children, we were poor and we were living in the Arsenal Courts projects, housing projects. And um, so I had to take the speech class. Oh gosh, I don't wanna take the speech class. So anyway, I took, I signed up for this class. My brother who's living with me, who had attended Black Hawk College, um, he asked who was who's the instructor and I told him the instructor's name. And he said, wow, if I'm not mistaken, he's like a, he's, he's a Southern Baptist minister. He said, I don't know how that's gonna go, <laughs> you know, for you. And so, but I took that as a challenge. Uh, the first um, assignment was to um, find some writers or write something of your own that you can share with the with the class. And I, um, uh, you could write it or, but but there was a there was a, a date, and you're going to have to get up here, and you're going to have to share what you found or what you've written. And so I went to the library at Black Hawk because in my mind, because I had these children, you see, and he was this Southern Baptist minister was either going to respect me or reject me. This is how I felt about it. And I had these children and there were times they were, they were young and I, there were going to be times when I wasn't going to be able to to be uh, in class because they were going to be sick. You know, I just knew, you know, and so I needed to find something to put to put it to the test to see how this would go. And so I went into the light into the library and I found it just, they found me uh, a book by Maya Angelou and a book by Nikki Giovanni. And I was 25, uh, 25, 26 years old, I think 25. And this book was uh, Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. And I literally, stood there and read most of the poems in the book standing right there. At that point, on that day, in that spot, I knew that I could write because she represented what I knew I could write about. She talked, all she did was tell her life and our lives as black people. Right. And so I became a writer at some point after that. And uh, yeah, so. I, I think it's really interesting that you're sharing this, this disconnect between, you know, maybe what our lived experiences are and what we're exposed to through our education. And I know our kids today feel that same way. Like they want content that's relevant. Um, and I can remember, like we still see schools like Harper Lee, To Kill a Mockingbird, Charles Dickens, Robert Frost. Like well, these are all kind of staples that I would say that are part of education system, um, particularly for those kids who are on like an advanced track. Uh, and so it's the same standard that has been set in terms of defining what authorship looks like, right? And so, um, you know, it's hard to read things that you're not interested in and that you can't connect to. And so I think that's part of where you see people kind of left behind. Um, and I, I'll just share this story real quickly. Um, I can remember, so my my, first, my oldest daughter, she learned to read kind of on her own, which I don't even know how that happens. And after going through a pandemic where I had to teach kids <laughs> how to do things and how to read, I'm glad she figured it out on her own because I'm not good at that. But I remember my child um, was, I can't even remember what the book was, but I sat there and I watched her sound out L and L and land. Land. She, her response when she read the first word that she was able to sound out on her own was like she discovered land. Okay. And in that moment, you know, from a parental perspective, I'm realizing that she's excited because she now has unlocked access to so many other things. She wouldn't articulate it that way, but I knew it was that way. And I suffered through a whole host of reading, uh, required reading material just so I could have access. Right. Um, and eventually I was able to find my own way and start to consume things that were meaningful to me, but they were certainly not introduced 
in our school system. And so I think that's why it's also really important that in the places where you all are contributing, you're reflective of some of those experiences that our youth can connect with to hopefully improve their literacy, right? But there is this world that's opened up to you if you decide to lean in and either write your story and share it with others or write your poetry and share it with others, but also for those who are willing to take the time to access it, right? Um, because there's so much more to the world than just the Charles Dickens and the Robert Frost and the those experiences are 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 not necessarily relevant to what even what today where is happening across cultures, right? Um, but somehow they are they have become staples. So I'd like to hear from you all a little bit more about how uh, you portray black figures, whether they're fictional or non-fictional, in your in your writings. And what does that mean uh, to you? How have you chosen to approach how you portray the characters, uh, sp specifically the the black figures? in your writings. Kia, I'll, I'll go back to you on that one. Okay, um, can you hear me? Great, okay, good. Um, I took out my, Air my AirPods, so I just want to make sure. Um, so basically, um, the good thing about growing up in Chicago is that, and in the places that I did, is that you pretty much see a little bit of everybody. You know what I'm saying? You pretty much know a little bit of everybody. You're introduced to a lot of um, a lot of uh, people in different type of careers. And so I really wanted that to reflect in my book. So you're not only, for instance, um, I have a book called <laughs> His Lover, Her Headache, The Side Chick Chronicles, right? Because two years ago, this big thing with side chicks was all out. You know what I'm saying? And so- um, Is that from I, ago? I feel like that's still kind of a thing. <laughs> <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> and so- um, I basically, um, I didn't want, because when we think of, unfortunately, you know, words have power and, and that power paints a, a picture for you vividly of, of, of that. So when you categorize a sad chick, I don't know about you guys, but I hear, you know, I think of like ratchet women or, you know what I'm saying? Like things like that of what, of what uh, society puts out, what media puts out. And in this book, I had women from all different walks of like all couples you know, they were all couples. They were all, um, um, two of them were successful, overly successful. Like, I just wanted to show that um, when it comes to affairs and, and broken hearts, it affects everyone. It's not just, you know, just one socioeconomic class. And that's pretty much what I try to do in my books is um, to introduce um, characters that are that is out of the norm, you know, um, out of, you know, like, you don't, you wouldn't think that you would um, talk to a teacher, but I have a teacher in my book. You know, you wouldn't think that you would talk to an interior designer, but she's one of the top interior designers in Atlanta in my book, you know, and, and then I go into details of, you know, the different products or the things that they're using, because I want my reader to say, hold on, pause, put the book down and Google, you know, what is this? What is that? What is she talking about? Um, to in, you know and, and engage and open their mind because I I want my reader that's rather they're in the hood middle class upper class um, to see themselves some way somehow in that book so all of my characters whether it's how they look um, I know uh, colorism has been a big thing in the black black community in the past couple of years whether it's light skin dark skin I include everyone I make sure that they're all beautiful it's not I stay away from derogatory um, um, things about people, you know what I'm saying? If they're gonna be throwing names, it's gonna be the couples when they're arguing. Like I'm very conscientious of that because I always tell people, I didn't know racism until I moved to the Quad Cities. I grew up with Asians, Hispanics, Blacks. It was all of us, you know, we, we look like a rainbow in my, in my pictures from Chicago. So I didn't know that until I came here and um, I didn't really have a voice or anyone to really go to, but my mom and my sister, and um, who was here with me. And so I had to pretty much create it in my work. And I really want to give a special shout out to Mrs. Darwin. I don't, I don't know if she's still teaching. She's probably retired, but she was at Moline High School, and I was terrified. I was taking a creative writing class, and I was terrified of giving her my work. So I'm like, you know, she's an older white woman and I don't know how she's going to take uh, this story 
and I still have it. Um, I told you guys I keep all of my, my old school writing stuff and she gave me an A on it and she even gave me tips like, how about she do this next time? You know, um, it was really, but it was so eye opening. Like I finally felt like, oh my God, okay. I found someone that, that understands here, you know? So that's pretty much how I try to. Awesome. Now I will, I'm gonna tell you now, I'm gonna have to go out and find Mrs. Darrow. And Mrs. Darrow was at Moline High School when I was there. So I don't know if we're the same age or not, but I know some of the teachers from there. So we're gonna have to find her so she can make sure she connects with that shout out. <laughs> Yes, um, tell her I love her. Thank you. Thank you for understanding my work. Right, right. So, you know, in your in your journey, I hear you saying you try to um, basically overcome maybe stereotypes that are out there uh, about certain populations uh, or about the Black community specifically um, to help people see things differently so that there's not this picture painted that, um, that maybe folks who are low SES have the uh, negative experiences and then maybe people with with money don't have those experiences or um things of that nature now you also referenced that you'll use details related to their careers right so you talked about interior interior design and creating this curiosity with your reader that they may have to go out and search for more information how do you, do you do that research um do you do interviews how do you get some of those details for your writings um, a little bit of both. Um, I, um, as far as I had no idea about interior designing, so it, it was required and I don't know any interior designers here. So it required a lot of Googling. Um, <laughs> I had to Google a lot, um, you know, different things, what they look for. YouTube has been like my saving grace for looking at videos on how they do it, how they put things together. Um, one thing that I tried to stay away from is, um, salary, um, putting a cap, you know, how you might Google, how much does an interior designer make? And they'll put like, you know, 50,000 a year average, you know, I wanted to, I always, um, uh, increased my people's salary, my character salary, because I want my readers to know that, uh, that's their average. It doesn't have to be your average, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and how they are in their role. So, um, sometimes, you know, we read a job description and we are only focused on just that job description, but we don't realize that we go so over and beyond on certain different things. So I really want to make sure I explain that. And that's where the YouTube videos come in, because the videos show you things that the paper doesn't. That's on paper. So that's a really good tidbit for my future writers out there. Um, also, um, I also get a lot of my ideas from movies. Believe it or not, you know, I, my favorite movie is Waiting to Excel and Love Jones. So I get everything from those movies. I um, I um, get my characters, how they are, you know, just, just everything. That's pretty much how I do it. Now you're going you're gonna to have me out here quoting Waiting to Exhale. Don't do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I open the door. Um, you know, I immediately go to that scene where like she's in, you know, she's separating from her husband and the sets the car off of all that. You know what I'm talking about. So um, one thing you said, and I appreciate you pointing to that resource and you hear more and more people talking about it. So um, Michelle, you talked about the encyclopedias and I feel like for this next generation it's like YouTube university, right? Like, <laughs> like it really is. And don't be ashamed of that. Like go out there. So, we have so many things at our fingertips, right? And you obviously you need to triangulate whatever data you're bringing in, right? You need to use pull different sources to make sense of, you know, your research. But I appreciate you putting that out there because people wouldn't always think to go to that space to be able to learn about a career. Reverend Ford. Um, especially given your your genre, can you tell me a little bit about how do do, do you have any fictional characters in your, or are you pulling strictly from um, non fictional uh, characters? Almost exclusively non fictional uh, for me. Um, part of the writing process because I write weekly because I preach, and so some preachers don't have manuscripts and they. I kind of know what they're going mentally. I always prepare a full manuscript. And because I am a lover of language, my biblical language is Greek. I studied Greek for three years. So that allows me to go into the contextual first century. So I have to understand not only the language, but the context. So if you're talking about um, Philippians, you're talking about the church at Philippi, which is different than the church at Corinth. And you got to understand the context. 
and the language helps you to understand the context in which things are written. So that's been my formation. So how do I tell the, the narrative of the people that are somewhat locked in time? Is that I generally find a way to start out with something historical, or I use my personal story to get into a deeper understanding, almost like a par par parable, where you tell a story that's familiar with people to get to a deeper truth. So the, the book that I've written, Never Easy, Always Necessary, um, I start off with the book talking about my first days at Greater Antioch. My first day at Greater Antioch, Greater Antioch I'm parking in the parking lot across from this very large Gothic looking stone church, uh, uh, kind of faded um, mahogany doors uh, that I would grab hold of. And on my way there, there are people standing outside waiting for the church doors to open. Reverend Cheney, who is the senior pastor, is not there. I go in uh, and I walk up to the to the secretary. We called them secretaries then, not administrative assistants or executive assistants. They were secretary, the church secretary, uh, and that was Miss Hall. And I said, Miss Hall, uh, I said, there's some folk outside waiting to get in. And I said, do you know what they want? And she said, well, they uh, they they're here to see you. And I said, OK, I just started. They don't know me. And she says, well, they need. I said, what do they need? They need their lights turned on. They don't have any place to stay. Uh, they don't have uh, the resources, not enough food. And I said, doesn't this city have social services? She said, yeah, they send them to us. Then I get a chance to tell the history of the black church and how right out of emancipation that it was the church that started the schools in their basements. It was the church that started savings and loan. It was the church that built out communities. So I use personal stories that I have to get to a deeper truth to lead our way back into what it should be and how we should be able to serve. So again, as an ethicist, I try to lean toward how is society gearing? Uh, how do we see ourselves? How do others see us? And how do we understand the other gaze on us so that we can maintain who we are? There, there's something I'll, I'll read here very quickly that gives me hope always. And it's um, the first black newspaper. And my, one of my relatives actually in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, the McFarland family owns the Insight, the black newspaper. So, and this is really personal to me because the first black newspaper comes on the scene, um, I believe 1827. And this is what they said. This is the Freedom Journal. This is what they said. We wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. Too long have the public been deceived by misrepresentations in things which concern us dearly or early. It should ever be our duty to vindicate our brethren when, the, when oppressed and to lay the cause before the public. I see that as my commitment is for too long others have spoken for us. We have to shape the narrative. We have to define. We have to shape what is good uh, and pleasant and healthy about our communities. No one's gonna love us like we love ourselves. No one can talk about us like we can quite talk about ourselves. And so how we frame that is important. So the use of language, um, even the examples I use on Sunday, I'm very particular with this. If I'm introducing any thought, um, I'm going to find how we introduce it through the historical nature and the history of Black folks. It doesn't mean that I don't read Paul Tillich. It doesn't mean that I don't read Niebuhr. It doesn't mean that I don't read Rosh and Bush, uh, all the other great uh, theologians. It just means that I'm very particular because we don't hear about ourselves. So I mention the books and then show on the screen the book I'm referring to. And then because we have a bookstore in the church, I tell them, go down there, you can get a copy after the service. That's purposeful. It drives attention so that they would have an insatiable appetite for love, for learning. I talked about my, my gravitation to my father for speaking. I saw the discipline of learning from my mother, who's an early childhood educator for 30 years. I saw her prepare those uh, lesson plans and have a love for teaching. I naturally have absorbed that. So if I'm speaking, I'm teaching. That is my responsibility to my community. If I'm speaking, I'm teaching. 
Yeah, definitely. And we see that in how you show up um, in the community. And so I, I continue to, and I, I feel fairly confident speaking for other folks too, um, when you walk into a space, how you enlighten the people around you. Um, I'm, I, nearly every time I've been in your presence, I, I'm able to learn something or glean something from, from that experience. And so thank you for standing in that space. And, and, and you know, I also realized that um, with what you're doing, you also represent so many other people who don't have the opportunity to do that. And so I, I just am very, I've always appreciated how you bring a context, whether it is a historical context or even you usually will tie things back even to language, you know, not just in your sermons. I've seen you do it even in conversation. So I don't know if you're always preaching or if you're. <laughs> Thank you for noticing. <laughs> uh, but, but on a serious note, you're gracious and um, uh, extraordinarily gracious and compliment. Uh, but I do think that the village, and uh, Michelle would agree with this, we're always talking about the village needs elders. Mm -hmm. that, that's where wisdom is imparted. That's how we learn and grow. A village without elders collapses. We, we're left with the Lord of the Flies and some juvenile uh, potential uh, kind of total collapse. It's, there's no way uh, that we can make it without people willing to provide instruction not always beating people over the head with it, but in ingratiating people, coming near them, talking with them, being present with them in pain. So you get a chance to have a deeper conversation later. Yeah, definitely. So I think that um, I'm gonna ask uh, you, Ms. Shelley, I'm gonna ask you a little bit differently because I wanna tie it into another concept that I want us to touch on. Um, you know, as you're doing your poetry or as you're preparing your writings, how would you characterize how you portray black folks? But also as you're thinking through that, like, who do you consider, who are you writing for? Are you writing for yourself? Are you writing for other, for the black community as your audience? Or can you talk to me a little bit about both of those, those uh, questions? Poetry. And I was writing, um, uh, based, you know, just from uh, Nikki Giovanni's and Maya Angelou's um, example, I, I I knew that I needed to write about what I knew about, and that was about myself and family and community. So it was at, before I started writing at Blackhawk. Um, I and Reverend Ford is talking about speaking. I was uh, introduced. Uh, to uh, tenant organizing. And so I was trained, I was organized and trained as a tenant uh, in the arsenal courts to help my neighbors and learned how to do that while I was living there, okay? And so we were given these, these skills and when you're, when you're tenant organizing, you are confronting the people who are in charge of where you live at. You know, this is those issues. And so they taught us how to do that. But then they did something else. They taught us how to invite these folks into our community center where we were at and conduct meetings and be in charge of those meetings. So all of a sudden we were in these positions where we were <laughs> We were uh, uh, conducting Robert's rules of order and we were telling people, those folks, you know, uh, when they could speak and when they could not speak, they were in. We, so we learned how to be leaders, basically. And so learning how to be a leader, I needed to learn how to speak. And that's where I learned to have the courage to be in that position, because basically Somebody told me that I could do that. I didn't discover that on my own. Somebody said, you know, you can be our speaker. Me? Well, they said, yeah, and I believed them. And so then I, that, that led to Black Hawk. That led to writing. I wrote about the things uh, that I had come to love, and that was family and those folks out there in my community. 
I wrote about my early experiences as a child, what it was like growing up in those projects where we loved as children. We're supposed to love our surroundings. My parents didn't understand. When I when they started reading, my parents started reading my poetry about living in the projects. They wanted to know is that that's how you saw that because they were being parents and they were out here working so that they could move us to another place. They allowed us to be children, and I, so I go back and I write about those things because what I found out very early is that uh, when I wrote about those, they, they were poem stories, and so when I was writing about those things. Other people understood those, those experiences and they didn't have to live in the projects because what I was essentially talking about was, I was talking about those elders where you can get an elder anywhere back then, you know, they're, they're all around us. You can see an elder everywhere. Um, you can see an elder at the grocery store. You know what I'm saying? I was talking about childhood games. I was talking about um, how it felt, you know? And so those were my early writings. And so, I continue, that, that is my foundation. So I continued um, to write and to, and, and I became that speaker. I became the, the, the storyteller. I became that person that I didn't think I could be, uh, but I didn't know that, I, did, I hadn't realized that those, those steps that I had been taking from then until right now, they had been preordained. They, I, my path had been set for me. It was going to be about the community because I saw the transformation in myself and I saw the transformation uh, with other people. And that was that leadership role that we were all taking, uh, speaking and knocking on doors and engaging. And then so my writing and my duty, my responsibility became to write for my people. And I knew, in addition to that, I knew that other groups would be able to understand that because I'm, I'm really writing about the human condition. Somebody's going to find some common ground in some of these things that I'm writing. Not everything, but some of these things that I was writing was going to. So I'm writing for that. But, I'm, but now I know. Now I know, I discovered that when I looked back that it was, it was designed for me in first grade. My first reader was about Dick and Jane and Spot. And these are white kids and they had a dog that had spots on it and we loved it because that's all you have. If you love to read and somebody's telling you they're gonna teach you to read and this is your first reader per se, I loved those books. I didn't care what those characters looked like. At growing up, I, I didn't really care. But then at some point, you know, you I came up in the 70s. And so that was, you know, now we're talking about understanding and and uh, and and speaking about the uh, inequalities in those in that in, in education and, and some of those things like that. How I learned how to advocate for my own children how I learned how to, to have those, those tools in my home so that they could do that. And I did, wasn't always successful because as I said, I didn't, I wasn't, I, I, you know, I didn't know what I was doing, but I picked up some things. But when I write now, and, and, and it's been that way for years and years and years, I'm writing for black people. I'm writing for black children. Um, I'm writing intentionally. And not like I said, not everything, but there's most of what I write is for that underserved population. Those kids, my kids, my grandchildren, your children are mine and they need to see themselves and they need to understand. They need to have what I didn't have and they need to understand that they can be who they want to be. And they need to see themselves in those in those books, in those chapters. They need to be able to envision um, themselves being being whatever they want to be. They want to be writers. They want to be writers. They want to do these things, but we have to put those images in front of them. And if those people are, don't are not residing in our community, then we need to bring them in so they could see 
those people. And so I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to publish or perish. That's my charge right now at this stage in my life. Um, I've been saying for the last five, six years, I have about five or six books in me and I choose to write for children. And, but that doesn't mean at this point, that doesn't mean that I'm not realizing that the, the book that I wrote, my first children's book, How Little Billy Learned to Play, um, that book was inspired by a real person, Bill Bell, who was uh, born and raised in, Rock Island, in East Moline, Watertown. And he talked about how those people and that place raised him to become this renowned um, music uh, jazz professor, music professor. He came right out of East Moline and he talked about that. And so I, that his story inspired me. And so I wrote that book to honor him, but to, but so that kids could see themselves. We know those kinds of communities. We, we grew up in those communities. They still exist, those communities that nurture children, you know, uh, but we need to be more mindful right now um, uh, of that fact. So I guess, you know, it's kind of contradictory I'm I'm writing for those kids. I'm writing for for our children, and I, and I, you know, I hope I have enough time to keep writing because that's 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 my responsibility. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think it's contradictory. I mean, I I hear I'm tracking where you're where you're coming from. You're writing. You started off. You have an evolution that you shared with us, right? And where you started and where you've ended are two different places, but that's such as life, right? You know, you don't all, you don't stay in the same place uh, forever, especially with a gift like yours. I wouldn't imagine, you know, that you would, right? There's creativity evolves as well, and so um, I hope that I pray that you you can continue to inspire and, uh, the youth, and you can continue to publish uh, so that people can uh, learn from you and be inspired by you. I do want to, uh, you know, as we approach our end, I want to make sure I give a chance for you guys to shed a little light on what you think is needed for uh, maybe those kids or young adults or older adults who maybe have a gift or a talent, but not yet the courage to put their work in front of someone. Or maybe they're too bogged down. They haven't been to YouTube University to find out to ha how to go about publishing, right? Um, or maybe there's just some barrier there for them. I've heard you mention drawing inspiration from the things around you, the people around you, the relationships that you've had, or those things that are important to you. I've heard at least two people reference Blackhawk and also Key. I heard you reference even a teacher in your high school. So Perhaps there's some connection there in terms of finding inspiration through your education. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm kind of synthesizing, you know, everything that I'm hearing. Beyond that, if each one of you, just briefly, if you would share with me, what do you think our community needs? What's a void that needs to be filled to inspire future authors, um, especially uh, Blacks? I'll start with you, Reverend Ford, then I'll go to Key, and then I'll close it out with uh, you, Miss Shelley. Um, thinking quickly on this, I, I dare say that as many children as we can to get a library card, as an adult, get a library card. It opens up the world. There's no shame in a library card. I can remember sitting in aisles in the library, reading there, we didn't even check the book out, just sit there. When I didn't have much money in college days, I would go to the bookstore and get a cup of coffee and read the book there. I would come back three days in a row, take notes and read the book right there and put it back on the shelf. Uh, there's ways that you can kind of incite that love for learning. If you're a little intimidated about the whole reading capacity, uh, start with what you love. Read that. Don't have to read what everybody else reading. Start with what you love. Build those muscles first. Um, Fred, Frederick Douglass in the narrative in the life of uh, Frederick Douglass in the book itself, when he is sold as property from Virginia to Maryland, um, Ms. Almed, which was um, kind of the mistress of the house, in that sense of quotation, she was a little more kind 
if you will. It's hard to say that a person that enslaves another is kind, it's oxymoronic. But she was teaching him how to read, not knowing that the Southern Virginia had a much different understanding. Uh, her husband walks in and slaps the books. This is my insertion of it. But he tells it that she, he comes in and interrupts her immediately and chastises her and says, what are you doing? She said, I'm teaching him to read. You can never teach a slave to read. He'll be no more fit to be a slave. So I approach it as you free yourself. Reading is liberatory. It's, it's freedom. You throw off shackles and mental shackles and restraints in community. So I would start with reading as much as you can, writing as often as you can. Don't worry about editing, just write, get it out of you and just put it on paper and, and allow that space to continue to kind of form. So have a regimen if you can. If you can't get a regimen, start with where you are. When you feel the inspiration, start there, keep pen and paper by the bed or wherever you kind of get inspiration. Uh, and then I would also say that in our communities, we need uh, the village atmosphere where we are putting books and people in front of them constantly. Whether or not the school district ever teaches a black history course, and they should, and we're gonna hold them accountable, we should already be doing it. These are our children. They should hear all of these wonderful authors that you brought together here, and we have to create these learning spaces and learning circles on our own watch. No one's gonna love them the way we can. Let's love them the right way. Thank you for sharing that. Well said. Key, what's your uh, your take on uh, what, what we need in this community? Well, I don't know how I'm gonna uh, follow up to uh, uh, Dr. Ford there. That was amazing. Um, he mentioned um, library cards and um, I have mine. I have both of them. This one is for here. And this one is actually from Chicago. Um, we had an incentive back in the day um, where we, um, whoever read the most books got a trip to Six Flags, got a ticket to Six Flags for free. Um, of course, they don't do that anymore, um, you know, with budget cuts and everything else. But these were programs that were implemented in school to get us to read. And every year I won that. <laughs> I have the um, I have the awards to prove it. I won that. And it's not to gloat, but it's literally to say, yes, I did it for an incentive. But look what it did to my life. Little did I know that um, that first uh, Dr. Seuss book um, or Roll of Thunder, Hear My um, Cry, which is another old school book, one of my favorite books. Um, little did I know that those books were going to open up my mind and paint pictures with it. I've never um, been in a profession where um, I am able to paint pictures with words. And that's what I want um, Black people to know, especially our youth, is that you are literally painting pictures with your words. There, When you're writing books like, like mine, um, where there are no pictures, the author is engaged in what you're writing. So like Dr. Ford said, do not be afraid to write. And another thing, I was embarrassed because I was writing love stuff. <laughs> and um, I was loving, I was writing love and drama. And I was afraid of how people may receive it. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I go in depth, I go in detail. And um, I didn't know how it was going to be received. And that's what took me so long to put out my book. My first book was done at 19. And so it took me almost 10 years to put it out. And I just want people to know, don't be ashamed. We need more black sci-fi writers. Don't be ashamed if you think, uh, I mean, you know, if you want to write about werewolves and type, there's an audience for everything. Literally, there is an audience for everything. We need more sci-fi writers. We need more technical writers. Even if maybe publishing your own nonfiction work is not your thing, um, Go to school to um, do um, um, computer publishing, computer technical writing. Um, there's so much. If you're a writer, you can pretty much write anything. All you need to know is the content and what you want to write. So do not, don't um, hold yourself back from that. Um, another thing also, like Dr. Forrest said, it takes a village. Um, sometimes, oftentimes, we put a lot of roles and responsibilities on our children. Um, a lot of things is um, sports driven or you know, with dancing or gymnastics and everything. And that's always fun, finding, you know, finding dandy and all. But one thing I will always commend my mother for is that she always made sure that we had a bookcase. 
um, a book a bookcase with um, uh, tons and tons of books. It got to the point where we used to donate books, you know, just give them away. She always said, it does not matter. You always read and, um, and always know where you came, you know, where you come from and everything else. So we were reading um, a lot of deep books, Dr. Ben, back in the day. We were reading, my mom was um, uh, very different, but um, um, she had us reading a lot of things to know who we are, what we came from as black people, to be proud of it. And also just to explore, you know, so we were reading things about, you know, we were reading books from Discovery Channel. We were reading books from Animal Planets. We were reading all this stuff. Um, and we weren't ashamed, you know, we we were, it was a safe place for us to read. And it wasn't just focused on, um, uh, um, you know, sports or whatever the case, dancing and everything else. So that's what I would say. And please guys, do not be afraid. Don't be ashamed of a library card. Um, don't be embarrassed of what you want to write about. Don't think that you, that there is no audience. We need you guys so much. We need sci-fi and horror black writers right now. I am, I am putting on a call. We need you guys. Um, go out there, talk to Tyler Perry, whoever. Just keep sending your manuscript in. Somebody will answer. <laughs> Listen, if you're talking to Tyler Perry, we need to connect. <laughs> it's just going right. to get a <laughs> um, You know, I was, I jumped in our little private chat that we have here. You talked about being able to go to um, Six Flags. And I'm like, all they gave us was a book it, a little piece. I, you, you could, there's not much I wouldn't have done to get that personal pan pizza from, from Pizza Hut. So if I would have had Six Flags on the table, honey, I would have probably been able to write a book by the time I was 19 too. <laughs> I'm like that funky piece of pizza compared to six flags. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. And you make excellent points. So I appreciate that. Um, Miss Shelley, we'll round things out for you. What do we need to fill the gap? What do we need to help these aspiring uh, authors? I'm going to uh, just, I agree uh, with everything that Keith said, uh, Reverend Ford, um, talked about, um, you know, having the books in the community that we need. And I wrote this down, um, that we need uh, bookstores or we need places where kids can just go and read. And I've always said this, books are missing out. I mean, books are missing in our community. I mean, we have to model this behavior. Um, Reverend Ford talked about uh, Greater Antioch, and I remember, was it mid 90s or, I can't remember, but Reverend Cheney uh, and, and the congregation, uh, the, uh, the house next door to the church was turned into a bookstore. It was that simple. It was a bookstore. And we can actually create those spaces. And we have to talk to one another we have to have some, we're gonna, we need some conversations, Reverend Ford. Uh, we need to have these conversations with other people who believe who believe that what we are saying here, all of us are saying here. And I know they're out there, but we need to open up. We need to have these conversations where we're um, opening up avenues and suggestions of how that could happen. How do we do this? I, uh, a few years ago, um, I, I had an idea that, during the summers, we could just have reading programs in the parks. You know, we don't have to have a lot of money, but where money is required, we have money. We have disposable income in, in our community. And we need to formally conduct these meetings and these discussions where like-minded people um, can figure out a way to make sure these 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 books are uh, uh, are accessible, um, I I like the idea that Reverend Ford said about we are responsible, and that's where this is coming from. If they never teach a black another black history uh, uh, class at any of our schools, shame on us for not teaching it. That's our job. That's our job. And and it's we have the model for that. These things have been done before. Absolutely. We're not talking. This is not rocket science. It's not new. And so we just have to do that. I I wanted to say that when we talk about modeling this behavior, 
um, that we have to be available to model that reader, that that reading, that that the act of actually picking up a book in front of children. You know, I have another idea for, I had another idea for, for a, a program. I don't know if it'll work in the pandemic, but it has to do with that, where we're inviting uh, families into churches or these King centers or wherever. And it's just a reading night and everybody's just reading. That's all they're doing. They're either in rooms reading to children or they're just lounging and they're just reading. And that's, it's as simple as that, but we, we have to begin um, this journey. Um, it has to start uh, back in the early 2000s. We created the Ebony Expressions Dinner and Book Discussions. And that was for the benefit of, of the adults, you know, that we would, that we were pushing, what we were encouraging was adult literacy because we need to model this behavior. And so we were choosing books and we were having dinner. We were, you know, having dinner and we were discussing these books. And we did that for a few, you know, several years. And it, and it works because people who didn't, who were not accustomed to reading, they wanted to be there for the fellowship. So some people would just attend just to be in that setting. Uh, two two of the of the meetings and then the third time the third discussion they've read they've come and they've read the book it's it's simple be simple yeah. it's simple i mean but we just have to be committed there and and as we're saying go back and do what worked right right we don't have to end this and this is common sense stuff that needs to happen yesterday yeah and yeah. so let's just do it Let's just do it. I appreciate it. Definitely. And I have some folks here on the line who would be happy to come alongside uh, as well. I think what will be most important in terms of, uh, as it relates to our conversation tonight, is I want to do a couple of things as follow up for people. We know people will visit this conversation at their leisure um, because it'll be on Facebook for a while. I want to make sure that um, anyone who decides to listen to this has access to um, your material that you all have published. So I will make sure I get the links from you so that we can uh, put that information into the chat um, in the comments when people are, are, are viewing this. I did have a question for Reverend Ford. I don't know if the Imagination uh, Library or I think it was called Imagination Library through United Way is still a thing. I think we probably should put some information out there. That's a free book once a month, right? Um, and I realize that it's not necessarily a book that um, an individual is choosing, but it's a place to start, right? Um, and so I think we need to put some resources uh, coupled with this conversation. And so I, I will commit to making sure I do that um, after this uh, conversation ends. But for now, we are going to go our separate ways. Uh, well, at least us in the audience, we're going to go backstage and probably carry on a little bit more. Um, but I appreciate everyone for joining tonight. And I so look forward uh, to our next hidden conversation. Have a good night. Thank you for joining us this evening for Hidden Conversations. The Hidden Conversations project is coordinated by Dr. Ladrina Wilson, Tracy Singleton, Dr. Lauren Hammond Ford, Ryan Sadler, and me, Jared Johnson. We would also like to thank everyone on the Intelligent Conversations Planning Committee and on WVIK's Community Advisory Board for their support and guidance. Support for tonight's conversation comes from a Healing Illinois grant from the Chicago Community Trust, as well as a United for Equity grant from United Way Quad Cities. And mark your calendars for March 10th, 2022, when Michelle Norris, longtime host of NPR's All Things Considered, Washington Post contributor, and author of The Grace of Silence will keynote our live Intelligent Conversation event, made possible by the Joyce and Tony Singh Family Foundation.